Now we're going to go to the next step, and we're going to say, as visionaries, and I think all of us in this room are visionaries, we're trying to figure out what it is that we're trying to go to and what does that look like. How as a visionary do you identify where you want to go and how you can actually get there in a way that's going to be measurable and you're going to see the impact? And in doing that, what do you fund? Because there's so many different things out there. So how do you identify in your vision what's there and what's the right thing to actually put your money behind and your resources behind? So we're going to start this next panel, and we have Nancy Lublin, who's the CEO of Do Something Good. Would you like to come up? You're getting a mic now because of that. <laughs> You should laugh at porn. Um, so my question is, do you have bright line standards for what is an innovative organization? So I'll, I'll, I'll give you um, an example. I have two standards. I'm wondering if you each have two standards. I have two standards. One is I think an innovative, whether it's a for-profit or not-for-profit company, has engineers or developers in the C-suite. Doesn't have to be the CEO or founder, but could be a very engaged CTO or COO who is an engineer or developer. Um, and I think that's because, we talked about this at lunch a little bit, I think that's because those people are used to building things that break or best case scenario are outdated in six months. So they're on an innovation cycle and they're not afraid of failure. Second thing that I think is a bright line standard, especially for not-for-profit, socially innovative organizations, is that they put as much as possible under a Creative Commons license. Because what that says is that their data, their content, whatever they can, they're not just looking to innovate internally, but they're committed to the notion of innovating in the sector more generally. So I'm wondering, do you have bright line standards for what it means? And then I'll sit. Okay. Jacqueline, I'm with Google.org. Um, so our entire C-suite is engineers, I would say. So uh, as a company, we sort of bring that lens, but we don't have that expectation uh, that every grantee will have that. Um, we do about 100 million in charitable and academic grants each year. And some of the things that we look for when we're looking at innovative groups are organizations who are taking on really tough challenges, right? We don't want the layups. Um, who are using technology in innovative ways. It doesn't have to be linked at all uh, to Google. In fact, I get in trouble if it is. Uh, so just innovative technology, but doing it at scale. So we definitely look at who, um, maybe in their track record to date, they haven't hit scale, but uh, if the play is successful, it's gonna hit scale. And scale to my boss means um, you know billions, right? Hundreds of millions, billions. Like They really want to see uh, the reach. So we look for that. Um, I think the other part is um, just something uh, more about Google, less about maybe the grantees in terms of what we look for. Our perspective is that philan um, philanthropists have a specific role to play in the whole ecosystem, right? We're not the government. We're not going to be delivering today's food at scale for everybody. Um, but what we can do is fund the innovation, right? And so we should be willing to take risks. We should be willing to take on things that the market is not going to take on. So we specifically, in every opportunity, look and say, um, do we, Google, have something unique to contribute here? Would anyone else fund this? 
the market or other funders with this? Um, if so, then why would we do it? Let's just back away, let others do it. So is there a unique um, role for us to play? And then also, uh, given who we are, what we understand, how we approach the world through data, we love to see organizations that are using data. Uh, <laughs> we've had conversations about this. Who are using data in their decision making. So we like to see um, evidence of data-based decision making, data plans, uh, and um, we also would share your um, standard for wanting to put as much as possible, make as much open source as possible, make as much part of Creative Commons as possible so others can benefit from it. Great. So you are the government. I am the government. Uh, <laughs> and I'm here to help. So <laughs> Awesome. Um, we accept. <laughs> so government, um, not known uh, as the greatest leader of innovation, um, but you're changing that. So what is your bright line standard for, how, how do you know innovation when you see it? Well, the first thing that I, I would like to emphasize is that the Social Innovation Fund, um, the, the, the mission we have is not ourselves to select innovations. So we don't stand in judgment of what ultimately is and is not innovative. Ultimately, what we're trying to do is help change the process by which private and public monies find the best uh, in a, innovative uh, uh, initiatives that actually have data of solving major problems. So we have a two-step process ourselves. We don't make grants to the actual service providing nonprofits, and we are exclusively focused on nonprofits, so which isn't to say, of course, that there isn't uh, just a, a profound potential for corporations and other forms to drive social innovation. There obviously is, but our focus is on, on nonprofits. But when you mean nonprofits, you don't mean all of those strewn companies that were described here in the last panel, <laughs> you at, or Detroit. You mean not, not for profits. Not for profits. Okay, got it. just checking. Yeah, as an organizational That form. was also funny. Yeah. yeah. So the, the, in fact, we have a two-step grant process. First, we're looking for grant makers who, in our judgment, have the wherewithal to take the money that we have match it, leverage it in other ways, and themselves then select organizations that have innovative models with the potential to drive significant solutions to big problems. So uh, a lot of what we look for in the first order of, of grant makers is very similar mm -hmm. to what Jacqueline was looking for. We're looking for track records of people who have the ability to spot quality and have been very effective in supporting organizations so that they can grow and demonstrate impact. Now, that just then, of course, begs the question of, so ultimately, even if we find organizations that have that track record, what is it that we want to see in what they have actually funded and grown? And um, I, I think th there it comes down to a couple of things also that Jacqueline alluded to. Um, one has to do with the potential to be significant in terms of the change that you drive. So that's a combination of, of uh, solutions being addressed, addressed toward really big problems, but also the, the character of the solution and its organizational form suggesting the possibility for growth. So that, that'd be one set of things. The other thing that I would strongly emphasize is, of course, evidence. And uh, we, get, we get a lot of pushback on that. In fact, I suspect that any of you uh, who see yourselves as being primarily social innovation uh, agents and are engaged in a lot of conversations around, quote, social innovation, unquote, uh, are frequently challenged to define what social innovation is, and you get into some pretty interesting discussions there. Uh, one thing that we have emphasized as that question has come to us, and this has frequently come to us critiquing some of the grants that have been made by the Social Innovation Fund or our grantees, has to do with the question of newness. And so one thing I would just want to emphasize is that while we, we respect new, that in our judgment, true innovation isn't about new versus old. It's about better versus worse. 
So innovation to our mind is a process of continually getting better and driving better and better solutions to problems that actually represent durable solutions and that enable us not only to, to solve the problems of more people in need, but as a society to realize greater impact for the investment that we make in, in uh, social innovation. So we're looking for better things that have uh, room for growth. I think, I think the challenge is uh, defining better and, and, and mm -hmm. some of these definitions, I mean, it's really hard, but Jacqueline brought up data. And um, uh, Reid Hoffman, who's, uh, who's actually on our board, um, at the Web 2.0 conference last year announced the birth of Web 3.0, hmm. which he said was all going to be about data, that the cost of collecting data, dissecting data, has gone down almost to the floor and that everybody really should be doing this thing. This is not for profit sectors that are late to this field. Um, we've now got our first data analyst actually full time on staff and, uh, and Beth Cantor, who is here, is actually writing a book on, on uh, a data driven not for profits that we're data informed not for profits sorry that we are all looking forward to reading here here's a question um, for you uh, both of you um, and and Paul this is in particular for you because and this is before your tenure but the social innovation fund really was just hammered in particular by the New York Times last year when the first grants were made I mean really if I used the word bludgeoned I would be generous and again that was funny and uh, and you weren't there. You weren't there. I was and there. it was the New York Times. You there. Okay, awesome. The so bruises you, don't show, you, but the they're there. Are, so and I and I, I don't write for the New York Times, so this is fair game. But um, you know they, they they hammered you guys, and uh, it was really that question of transparency. Yeah, yeah. So here is a question for you. The question is, why are grant applications and evaluations? This could be for both of you or anybody. Mm -hmm. Private. Why aren't they all? public, much like, like, like an XPRIZE. The idea that all of this, of the idea is to foster so that if someone applies for, for funding from the Social Innovation Fund, all that information is public on the web and anybody could read it and someone in India could go, wow, that's brilliant, I want to do that here, or we should work together. And then the results, all of this question about impact and wow, what's the impact of these things, what about making, and this, this would be a big deal, Zeev, if today, you know, uh, foundations decided we're all just going to be completely open and public. Why have the process be in a lockbox? Uh, with respect to the Social Innovation Fund, uh, we are, we are uh, I'd say, I was going to say completely transparent. There are some boundaries, but we are in the spirit of your question, Nancy. We are fundamentally transparent. Um, you can see on the web the um, uh, executive summaries of all applications that have ever been submitted to the SIF. You can see the entire application for uh, all of the 16 organizations that have been funded by the, the Social Innovation Fund. For those 16, you can see verbatim uh, critiques that were generated through the external review process. Um, we, with, now to the boundary, we are, you know, we're a public competition where a lot's at stake. So God bless the organizations who, who are willing to to submit themselves to a very public competition with perceived high stakes because in, in the, the reality of the world in which we live when, when most funders of nonprofits uh, do so with, uh, based on criteria that to say the least uh, can be mysterious, there can be enormous downside, there can be enormous upside to winning a social innovation grant or getting, you know, getting the affirmation that it implies as well as there would be from mm -hmm. getting funding from Google. But there can be tremendous perceived downside to, to not getting funded. Um, so we try to balance, we try to balance that. Uh, but uh, in addition to the things that I mentioned that we actually do post, we provide complete verbatim feedback from all of these external review processes to all of the organizations that have, have applied. Now, we, we only publicize the feedback for the ones that won. But our feeling is that this is, we're about trying to, to develop momentum around processes that, that reward solutions that actually can solve our most uh, intractable problems. And so, you know, we feel in those circumstances, we have tremendously powerful and information it, it we have deal. to share. It was a big deal when you yeah. made everything transparent. That was, that was big news. Mm -hmm. It's the first of its yeah. kind. Have you seen a chilling effect? Have fewer organizations applied because they know their stuff is going to be totally public? Or um, have you yeah. seen more collaborations spring up? What's been the impact of deciding to be transparent? We have received a lot of mixed 
um, you know, f feedback, frankly. I mean, so uh, I think the, uh, in general, it's been very positive because very much in the spirit of your question, uh, not only uh, does, d does the public or do other entities out there want to know what's going on? Other mm -hmm. funders want to know. They want to know why an organization was funded and so it reflects well on them that they can, can read these things. To the question about a chilling effect, uh, we don't in fact know. It is a fact that we received significantly fewer applications the second year than the first year. But there were a lot of factors going on other than possibly that dynamic. Uh, most importantly, the fact, that, and this is literally true, that the same day, April 12th, 2011, that was the application due date for our second round of applications, was the same date on which it became clear what appropriation the Social Innovation Fund was gonna receive from the Congress. So our entire application process had taken place, which is a rigorous, demanding process that requires a tremendous investment on the part of any applicant. That entire process took place during a time when no one could have judged how much money we would be in a position to, to distribute. So it's, uh, it, it is complicated. I, before, I just wanted to address evaluation. We have a very rigorous uh, evaluation requirement where literally every subgrantee, so all of the nonprofits that receive funding from our grantees are required to be connected to a rigorous impact evaluation that will drive them to moderate or strong levels of evidence. As you can appreciate, that's a multi-year process, mm. but I assure you, those results will be made public. I think that's the key, you know, whether you want to make it open um, who applies and, and the winning proposals, I think is interesting. More transformative, I think, is to actually publish the results of what happened with the money. So we sort of threw this idea out to grantees um, a couple years ago and got a very, <laughs> very non-interested response. Um, and I think it's part of just the culture, right, is that, um, and let's be realistic, nonprofits have to compete for funds. And so everyone wants to tell the winning story. We got this money, we reached this many people, we did these great things, we scaled this great heights. Very few people want to share the story of, well, you know what, we made a big bet on this technology and boy, did we pick the, the wrong horse. But, you know, let's let the entire field know so no one else picks that horse. Or, you know, this is, this is what we've experienced and um, boy, we uncovered this out in the field about what was really going to take off and really going to work. So I think it would be absolutely transformative for the field and I think that uh, people on the f funding side um, should help instigate this is to ensure that anyone who receives funding um, publishes reports, makes them transparent, and um, I think we really have to encourage, you know, it, in the tech world, you know, at Google, we have this fail fast um, mentality, which is like there's no shame in failing, right? There's, there's shame in not moving fast enough, or not thinking ambitious enough, or not really going for it. But there's no shame in getting out there, making a reasoned bet, and then failing fast. Um, so I think we could encourage a little bit more of that culture. Well, I think that's unusual uh, for a funder to suggest that. Typically, not-for-profits are not supposed to talk about their, their failures. Well, and funders want to show off and talk about all the success that they've created. But I think in, if we're keeping our eyes on the prize and thinking about long-term impact, and what are we actually trying to achieve, and what's the best way for the entire ecosystem to get to that goal the fastest, it's by if we would all open source this. I was talking to my friend uh, Raj, who I uh, used to work with at the Gates Foundation. He now runs USAID about, you know, what if we made all, <laughs> every single USAID grant, you know, and publish all of the reports and every single private donor, you know, and we publish them all and you could just geolocate it so you could just go out, say, on an earth layer or something and you could just go to Kenya, you could go to this one area and you could see what is every World Bank project, what is every DFID, CETA, Gates Foundation, Google, just anyone funding, and what have the results been? You know, I mean, how transformative would that be if you could see, hey, let's look at everyone doing clean, wa clean water in this area, and let's look at what they've learned and what they're doing. Um, I think we, that could be really transformative. So what is something that you wish you could say, we've got five minutes left, so this, we'll make this our last sort of, uh, our last question. What, um, what is something that you would like to say to people who are applying to you that they don't know, that they really should know? And I'm gonna do the inverse. Uh, I'm gonna say something to funders out there that I wish that they would do differently, which is uh, data analysts and uh, developers, technologists are not 
overhead. That's right. Um, and so uh, I can say that's like that's like quoting Star Wars here in Silicon Valley. It's totally a safe thing to say. It's like a, it was too easy, right? That was, <laughs> yeah. Okay, that was preaching to the choir, but whatever. Uh, for the foundations of the room who don't quite get that you're sitting in Silicon Valley and you don't wield a blue lightsaber, um, funding data analysts and technologists that's not overhead, you are directly impacting like the heart, the artery of uh, any social good thing that you touch. So spend liberally. And I, that wasn't a political endorsement. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was. Um, Don't you, I think it's, that it's, was. Come on, I'm funny. <laughs> I am funny. Okay. So, um, uh, so what, would, so what go, is one I'll thing? Go, first. go so, ahead, Jasmine. So you go first. What's something that you wish people applying to would do? Count, this is counterintuitive, but what I would say is, don't pimp yourself out for the donor. Right. What we're really attracted to is when we can tell that we're dealing with an entrepreneur with an organization is that's going to do what they're going to do, whether Google comes on board or not. Right. So sure, you can you know, um, be flexible around the edges, and if Google requires you to have a data manager or whatever, you know, that might be part of the plan. But we're looking for people who are so passionate and committed about their vision and what they're trying to achieve that you know, if, if the Google money's not the right fit, they're going on to the next thing. So what, what distresses me sometimes is when, when people come in and they're just, I can tell they're just really fishing to try and figure out where the money is, and then they try and shift their mission to that, rather than just looking for the right backing for, for what it is they know in their heart is the right thing to do and what they're best at. That's good advice, that's good advice. Um, I would agree with that. The one thing I would add is to think big. Yeah. Think really big because um, you know, you, no, no one here needs to be told, but our problems are big and they demand big solutions. And so um, the Social Innovation Fund is a really distinctive, not unique necessarily, but a really distinctive opportunity for an organization that is thinking big, that has really a clear sense of what a problem is and the character of it, that has thought very systematically and soundly about a set of interventions that if, if brought to scale, actually have a chance of helping us get traction on these yeah. problems. And so that situ situation should not be ignored. It should be embraced, even if there are you know, myriad potential downsides. Yeah. Can I say another one quick one? Yeah. The other thing is convince me that you're really focused on the problem and not your organization, that you're committed to the solution and that you know, it drives me nuts when I have conversations and I'll say, oh gosh, what you're doing is fantastic. You know, there's this other group doing this complimentary we'd like to fund and bring you together. And they're like, yeah, not so interested. That's, you know, I, we're interested in people who are committed to solving the problem and to in, the impact on humankind and not about growing their organization or, you know, having their um, cocktail party circuit conversation. Let, so let's spend two seconds, if we can, two minutes on redundancy. There is a lack of market forces in the not-for-profit space to encourage any M&A activity. The number of nonprofits in the last decade has increased by three times, and you it's know fast, it's fast. It's growing faster than the U.S. economy. At the same time that donations are dropping, we need consolidation. Yeah. You know, coming from a business perspective, we need mergers, right? We need the most innovative to thrive, and we need some mergers, and we need the ineffectual ones to drop out. So the not-for-profit sector um, is, would be the seventh largest economy in the world. It is growing faster than the U.S. economy. Um, I know the last panel talked about organizations, right, that are strewn everywhere. Not-for-profits are like cockroaches. They never die. Um, you, know, you know, it's like we need like funders to get a big spray can of RAID and to spray it out there and encourage these organizations the to work funders. together and partner. Not the funders. The funders shouldn't be the RAID so because who, who, sometimes we're the problem because we don't know the solutions as well, the people on the field. Let's let the data decide. You know, if we were all really transparent about what's right. working and what's not, you know, the problem will take care of itself. So one solution is transparency. Another is, I mean, you can be a terrible, I, I like to describe it this way. If you have two donut shops next to each other, and one of them has a mouse problem and the donuts are stale and crusty and the other one is like Krispy Kreme back in the heyday. Um, clearly Krispy Kreme back in the heyday would, would, would like put the other one out of business. Unless the other one decided to become a 501c3. Then it would host a dinner, sell the name to its store and it would still keep selling crusty mouse ridden donuts. Or another problem is that anybody who, who felt they wanted to a donut and came to these two shops the only data they would have is the way each one described their product. Yeah. And so 
that is a huge problem. So right. other than think big, the other thing I would say for any nonprofit out there is aggressively embrace data. Yeah. Because, and especially moving forward. And so I think one, one of the questions that was asked in the last the session was, what's new? And one of the most important things that's new now is we're running out of discretionary money. The government is. Uh, philanthropy is not, but is under similar pressures. So the competition mm -hmm. for funding is going to get greater and greater, which means that the decisions that any funder makes about who to fund and not fund will take on more and more importance. So there's a lot at stake, and funders need to follow the data and demand it, and the nonprofits need to embrace it. Great. I think that's a great place to end. Yep. Thank you.